God's word upon which we base our message this day is recorded for us in the gospel appointed for this weekend from the gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 29 through 39, words that we have heard read just a few moments ago. In the name of Jesus, dear friends. I sometimes have a weird sense of humor. I will see something on TV or hear something and I'll try to make a joke about it or a pun and when I do this, my wife simply looks at me and groans. Oh no, not again. When she does this, I respond by asking, do you get it? And she just groans again. Well, I hope and pray that uh, after we take a look at Mark's gospel today, we, all of us, will get it. Out of the four gospels, Mark's picture of the disciples is perhaps the harshest and more often than not the disciples as they see what Jesus is doing they don't get it they don't understand the mission that Jesus had to bring salvation to all people and that's what we've been talking about in this epiphany season during January and February that God sent his son Jesus for all people in the world in fact, in the book of Acts, they are even, the disciples are even described that as being hard-hearted. The time that they're spending with Jesus doesn't even seem to help them understand. But later, we know they understand. Later, when all is said and done, all of the disciples, not just Peter, they stand up and they assert that they will not deny Jesus. So the question for each one of us today then is, do you get it? Do we get it? Let's talk about what is uh, happening here in Mark's gospel this morning. We start out uh, seeing that Peter, well, actually realizing that Peter was married and that he had a mother-in-law. The house that uh, Peter had was in, 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 in uh, Capernaum along the Sea of Galilee. And right now, today, there's ruins of it, but they built a church over it. Peter was married, had a mother-in-law, and she lived with them. She was sick. She had a fever, we're told. But in those days, when you got a fever, they didn't have antibiotics like we do today, and you could die from getting a fever. So this was a serious matter. And so Jesus walked into the house, and he went into the room where she was lying down, and he took her hand and he lifted her up, and she was well again. She was healed. And to show that she was really well again, Mark's gospel says that she got up and she prepared dinner. The disciples were amazed. They were amazed at what they were starting to see Jesus do. He had power to even heal the sick and to cast out demons. The crowds came. And the people heard about this miracle and they came to the house and they wanted to bring their sick and their people who were suffering in their family. Many people kept coming. All day they kept coming to see Jesus who was a miracle worker and suddenly it came to the end of the day and we're told that they closed the door and they went to sleep and Jesus went to sleep too. And the next morning, the people started coming again. We want to see this Jesus. We want to see this healer. But Jesus wasn't in the house. The disciples had to go somewhere else. They had to look for Jesus. And eventually they found him, and he was found in a desolate place, somewhere kind of secluded out in the desert in a wild area where most people didn't really spend any time. And they went out and they found him in this desolate place, and he was praying and again, this really didn't make sense to the disciples. Peter and the disciples were thinking that Jesus had just started his ministry. The crowds were showing up. He was becoming popular. They were getting excited. If Jesus would just perform a couple more of these miracles, then more people would come. He'd get a following. Maybe they would even be able to get an army together. Maybe they would be able to overcome the Romans who were in charge. And they could get out of their captivity from those people and be on their own again. And the disciples thought, well, you know, Jesus is so powerful. He can keep evil away from us. 
and we don't have to be afraid of anyone. Life could be really good following this Jesus. Why hasn't he been building up his popularity? He's famous now. Why is he out there hiding in that desolate place? And these are the questions that were going on. And so the disciples tell Jesus that many people were coming now to the door. They're coming to see him. And Jesus turns to them and says, let's go to some other places and preach. And Jesus is telling them he wants to go somewhere else, to another town, to people who haven't heard about him, so that he could call them to repentance, so that they would repent of whatever sin is leading them away from God, so that they would believe in him. Sins that were separating them, sins that were preventing them from following Jesus, sins like doubt and bitterness of heart, sexual immorality, lying and cheating, addictions, materialism, bigotry, and the list goes on. All these things that keep people away from a relationship with Jesus. And so Jesus wanted to go on to the next town and to the next town and the next town and start preaching and teaching the good news that forgiveness came through him. And this is what Jesus said. Would you read it with me? Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. So much in this sentence. Jesus was talking about new starts and new believers. Jesus was talking about taking the good news of Jesus Christ to people who didn't know that they could have forgiveness, that didn't know they were loved by God, those who were afraid of God, that didn't know that they could have forgiveness and eternal life. And so the disciples didn't really understand these things. Of course, later on they did through the grace of God. Jesus was in a desolate place. That's what the scripture says. A desolate place because it was there that Jesus confronted the temptations that were coming to him. He was the very son of God. He was God and man at the same time. He was tempted. He was tempted to give up his mission, to go in another direction, not to go from village to village teaching and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, healing the sick and casting out demons. He was tempted to go and abandon the ship. He had been sent not to build an army, to overthrow governments, but he came to overcome Satan. That was his mission. He had been sent not to carve out a few square miles of ancient Israel and set up a new garden of Eden, but he came to open heaven's gate for all people. And his mission was not to become a miracle worker who would satisfy the desires of those who stood in line to see him, but to do, to do his Father's will, which was to bring the message of forgiveness and eternal life to all people. And this was the temptation. This was the temptation that was facing Jesus now. These temptations were very real, but he didn't give in. He was being tempted to abandon what he was sent to do. He had been in a desolate place before. Remember, he had been there before. In the wilderness, Satan came to him and tempted him with this very temptation, saying, you, Jesus, if you'll just bow down before me, I'll give you everything, as if he owned anything. Jesus refused. He didn't give in. And three years later in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night that he was betrayed, when he was sentenced to die, he was tempted to walk away from this mission. And what does he say? He prays, Father, not your will, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will. And Jesus does not give in. He goes to the most desolate place of all, he goes to the cross. It is the place there where all of our burdens and all of our hurts and all of our sins are gathered together. It is a place of punishment for him. It is a place of agony and suffering. It is a place of death as he goes to that cross. And yet out of these places of desolation comes our eternal salvation and healing and destiny. His mission was to bring forgiveness. 
His mission was to open heaven's gate. His mission was to bring us eternal life. And so Jesus rises from the dead. And Satan is defeated. Evil is cast aside. And sin cannot hold him down anymore. And the mission is accomplished. Salvation is one for all people. And the, the disciples finally get it. They finally get it. And you know, I can understand how Peter and the disciples really didn't get it at first because they hadn't seen Jesus die on the cross. They hadn't seen him put into the tomb and then rise again. They hadn't walked with Jesus, the risen Christ, when so many people saw him after he had been raised again. But what about us? I'm afraid that we don't always get it. Think about it. Think about what we ask for when we pray. And sometimes I get uncomfortable with myself because the majority of my prayers seem to be so self-centered about being able to be well and, and praying for the sick and, and for myself and, and, and about things that go wrong with my job. Always something about me for protection, for health, for safety, having enough money to pay the bills, those kind of things. And, and yet, how often do we pray about the growth of the church? How often do we pray about people who don't know Jesus, that they would believe in him? How often do we pray about, about doing what is right in the sight of God in this crazy kind of culture we live in? How often do we pray about repentance, about resisting Satan, about resisting temptation, about our own salvation and our walk with God. There's nothing wrong with praying about health and protection and even money, but the majority of our prayers need to focus on why Jesus came. It needs to be focused on getting the message out to others about his forgiveness, his love, his compassion for us. And so now comes that question that is the title of our message today. Do you get it? Do I get it? Do you get it? Do we get it? Do we understand that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost and that we are his partners? We are his ambassadors in sharing that good news. Now, during January and February, during the Epiphany season, we've been challenging all the members of our congregation to support individuals and organizations that get it, that are reaching out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as part of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, we are located in what is called the Northern Illinois District, we have over 250 congregations. Some of them are growing. Some of them are not. Some of them had to close this past year. And our Northern Illinois district is taking the lead on, in, in our whole synod. Other districts are looking at our Northern Illinois district and seeing what they're doing because we are emphasizing that when it comes to why Jesus came, we really get it. Our emphasis is called new starts and new believers. We're not just talking about people who are Christians going to a different church, but we're talking about people who don't believe in Jesus, coming to faith in Jesus, new starts, new believers. It's taking place across our district in Manhattan, in Forest Park, in Rockford. Even our own group of Ethiopian Lutherans who are worshiping here is considered a new start. What a privilege it is to see these things happening. Special grants are given to help start ministries where the gospel has not been shared. Loie and I have been supporting this ministry, New Starts and New Believers, for the last several years. This weekend, we're going to have another opportunity to have a free will offering for our district's New Starts, New Believers ministry. The question is, do we get it? Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. This is our mission, to get that message out to all people. And as we leave today, I pray that 
every single one of us, through the power of God's Spirit, will be able to stand up and say, I get it. Will you say it with me today? I get it. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.